So uh, I am pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Paolo Sosi. Uh, he received his PhD from Australian National University and is now the Ambizio, Ambizio, Ambizio? am I saying that right? Ambizione. <laughs> Ambizione, okay, I'm not even close. <laughs> Ambizione <laughs> fellow at uh, ETH in Zurich. Uh, Dr. Sosi's research interests lie on unraveling the high temperature properties of melts, minerals, and vapors in order to understand the structure and evolution of rocky planets. So I'll turn it over to you, Paolo. Thank you very much, Joe, for the, uh, for the invitation and thanks for uh, coming. Um, the uh, topic of today's talk is about the redox state of Earth's magma ocean and <clears throat> how we can go about establishing that it actually, uh, the atmosphere that it was produced during outgassing of this magma ocean was actually quite similar to that we, which we observe on Venus today. And of course, as, as ever with these sorts of work, uh, work uh, projects, they are a collaborative effort um, and they involve scientists from here, ETH, also from the IPGP in Paris, uh, the ANU and uh, the University of Chicago. So when we look at the current day composition of planetary atmospheres, uh, we observe that uh, for the terrestrial planets, Venus, Earth and Mars that have, have uh, substantial atmospheres, Actually, there's a curious fact that the CO2 to N2 ratio is quite similar for Venus and for Mars, uh, where it is, it is very low for the Earth, which is, of course, sandwiched between these two bodies. And this, this very similar CO2 to N2 ratio uh, comes about notwithstanding the fact that the total pressures on both Venus and Mars are, ra uh, are uh, widely different between the two, between the two planets. And so the question is, uh, given this sort of spatial arrangement of the, of the planets, why then does the Earth have such a strange, uh, with respect to its neighbors, atmospheric composition today? And so that's kind of a point of interrogation. But before we get into the uh, reasons for perhaps such different, differing atmospheric compositions, it is useful to here to um, define some, some terms. And so the way that atmospheres are typically classified can be described as either a primary atmosphere, and that is one that has been captured from the solar nebula gas that initially uh, enshrouded the planets uh, during their formation. And this is composed largely of hydrogen and helium. However, for most of the terrestrial planets, this stage doesn't last very long because uh, over the course of planetary accretion by impact events, by heating, by radioactive decay, etc such a nebula atmosphere becomes supplanted by what's known as a secondary atmosphere, as shown schematically here. And this is one that has been formed by the outgassing of material, uh, of, of, of rocky material from the interior of the planet. And so this, instead of hydrogen and helium, can consist of heavier species such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water. Um, of course, if this atmosphere has been modified subsequently by biological activity as observed on the Earth, uh, it is now termed a tertiary atmosphere. Uh, however, of course, we, we think that only to be the case for, for the Earth at this stage, but uh, you know, time will tell. Um, so the subject of this talk is really to try and un to understand the genesis of atmospheres uh, during the accretion or final parts of the accretion stage of the terrestrial planets, and in particular, why the Earth is so special in this regard. Um, you may now be asking, well, why do these atmospheres matter? What is, what is the significance of knowing what the composition of Earth's atmosphere was uh, at time zero? Well, um, you know, more than 100 years ago, the Charles Darwin came up with this idea of um, life having started in warm little ponds. Now, of course, this idea hadn't been really quantified by, by Darwin himself, but it was taken further, and in particular, by a uh, couple of scientists from the University of Chicago in the 1950s, um, Harold Urey and Stan Miller, uh, Miller um, who performed an experiment that was thought to simulate perhaps uh, an atmospheric situation on the early Earth in which a reducing atmosphere composed of methane and ammonia was exposed to spark discharge in order to simulate lightning and in the presence of water to simulate the oceans. Of course, the results of these experiments were, were rather, um, rather, rather um, significant in that they produced about 23 uh, amino acids, some of which were uh, later found to be necessary for life. And so this kind of sets the scene for a potential type of atmosphere that may have existed on the early Earth, but that 
uh, idea is not yet set in stone. And so the question then becomes, did such an atmosphere that um, um, Miller and Urey had envisaged in the 1950s, did that actually exist uh, on the early Earth and therefore uh, such a uh, prebiotic synthesis scenario would have been uh, viable? So in order to answer this question, we need to look at some of some chemical evidence for what type of atmosphere the Earth currently has. And already over almost 100 years ago, it had been noted that uh, in, in an article in Nature, that uh, there's an abnormal scarcity of the inert gases, i.e. the noble gases, with respect to other um, similarly volatile, yet more reactive gases that are also in the atmosphere, such as the ones shown on the right here, uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, etc. So this, this plot essentially shows the abundance normalized to the solar composition for volatiles uh, in, the, in the bulk silicate earth. And this is paper by Bruce Fegley and Laura Schaefer. Um, and here essentially what they, what they observe is that um, these elements that are uh, only being only kept in the earth by atmospheric, um, uh, by, by being posted in the atmosphere, including the noble gases, are essentially much more depleted by a pro, sort of a factor of uh, 10, uh, sorry, five, six orders of magnitude um, than their more reactive counterparts. And so what this suggests was, is that um, the Earth has a secondary, i.e. post-nebula atmosphere, because if the Earth had a nebular atmosphere, we'd expect the abundances of these um, elements to be in their solar ratios rather than in these fractionated ratios that we observe today. And so a mechanism or a potential mechanism that may explain this observation uh, is indeed the moon forming giant impact. And as shown in this cartoon, the impact between a sort of canonical Mars sized impactor and an Earth sized uh, target uh, already with a proto atmosphere or, or not um, would have caused substantial melting and uh, potentially also enough energy to melt the entire mantle if we take typical heat capacities for basaltic rocks and we calculate the energy deposited by such an impact, we can, we can obtain values of the order of 6,000 Kelvin in terms of a temperature increased, increase uh, initiated by, by such an impact. And so this is clearly uh, a, an effective process in stripping the mantle as shown here by some sort of bow wave that propagates through the body. Um, but also we have chemical and isotopic evidence to suggest that these noble gases were lost early in Earth's history. In fact, um, if we're looking at xenon isotopes, uh, it indicates that more than 97% of the Earth's xenon was lost before 100 million years. And in fact, this figure goes down if we consider that uh, there may have been some more xenon loss uh, in the Archean. So these point to uh, both, there's both chemical and isotopic evidence to suggest that the Earth's um, nebular atmosphere was replaced by a secondary atmosphere, uh, most likely during such a moon forming giant impact. Then what the scenario that we envisaged to, would, ex would have existed on the earth at this time would have been uh, something known as a magma ocean in which uh, either the mantle is wholly or at least partially molten. And that, uh, that magma ocean is then able to uh, easily interact with the surface through convection and produce uh, outgassing of a new atmosphere um, composed of uh, heavier uh, molecules than hydrogen and helium. Um, now, the identity of such an atmosphere is unknown simply due to the fact that we don't know what the redox state of the atmosphere was at this time. Was it one uh, a reduced atmosphere dominated by ammonia and methane as, as was envisaged by Miller and Urey, or could it have been rather more oxidized and have uh, carbon dioxide and, and water species uh, dominating uh, the atmosphere? Um, so this is, a, this is really uh, the, the, state of, the state of the art up to this stage is that this, this process is very poorly understood. How we can use this thermodynamic identity and say that at equilibrium, the oxygen fugacity or in an ideal gas, the partial pressure of oxygen um, in the mantle must be equal to that uh, in the atmosphere. So that is the atmosphere um, sets or is it reflective of the oxidation state of the magma ocean. And so with this, with this idea, um, we can 
look for traces of oxygen fugacity uh, in the Earth's mantle to then say something about the Earth's early atmosphere. And the most common element we use for that is iron, simply due to its uh, abundance. It is the most uh, abundant uh, multivalent element in the Earth's mantle and is therefore thought to be a good indicator of what the oxygen pressure is um, or was at the time. And so this is the, this is the key reaction that we're looking to investigate in the equilibrium between iron 2 plus in the silicate mantle plus one quarter O2 in the atmosphere equals Fe3 plus in the silicate mantle. And of course, then in equilibrium, we can write the equilibrium constant for such a reaction uh, in which we have the equilibrium constant K, which is known for pure phase thermodynamic data, but not for complex silicate melts. Um, then we can also, we also look at the ratio iron three plus to iron two plus in terms of their activities, which we can measure in natural rocks and also in experiments. And finally, the oxygen fugacity, which is controlled in experiments and can be calculated in natural rocks from the Earth's mantle. But in addition to the oxygen fugacity, the iron three plus to two plus ratio of magma not only depends on uh, the oxygen fugacity, but on composition and on temperature. And that is the composition of the melt in which iron dissolves. So it's not pure iron three plus and pure iron two plus, but it's these species in a silicate melt of a magma ocean composition. And indeed this magma ocean composition is not uh, a basalt uh, as it is for um, you know, rocks that are erupted at Hawaii, for example, but is actually a, a rock type known as pyridotite. And, and for, for such a reaction in a pyridotite liquid, the equilibrium constant uh, remains unknown. And so that is, that is the logical step that we need to understand if we are to be able to predict the composition of an early atmosphere. And just to illustrate um, how poorly this is known for pyridotitic melts, we can use the models that already exist for basaltic melts to try and predict what the composition of the atmosphere would be. So if we take um, a iron three plus to two plus ratio of 0.037 and fix a temperature that we think that may be on the surface of a magma ocean um, about 1900 Celsius. And so this 3.7% this value comes from observations from mantle rocks today. Then we can plot in these vertical dashed lines the ratio of um, CO to CO2 and H2 to H2O that would occur um, predicted by this model. So if we have, if we keep the iron three plus two plus ratio constant and we use different calibrations to calculate FO2, we see that these uh, vertical lines indicate um, the possible uh, FO2s that we, that we are calculating um, from different models. And so what this shows is that one model predicts that there should be mainly CO and H2, whereas another model, it uh, doesn't matter what they are, but they're common models in the literature, another model predicts that we have essentially water and CO2. So the existing models clearly are not helpful in, that, in, in, in helping us to discern between what sort of atmosphere would have been produced given that we can measure the iron three plus to two plus ratio and at a, at a realistic temperature. And so that really provides the motivation for this work, and that is to calibrate the equilibrium constant of this reaction here for a realistic pyridotite, i.e. mantle-like liquid composition instead of these basaltic liquids. And so how, you, how do we do that, you may ask? Um, what we do is to synthesize in the lab a, a composition, a rocky composition that resembles pyridotite, and we're using uh, a famous one from Kilbourne Hole, uh, KLB1, which is approximately representative of the whole Earth's mantle, or we think, at least we think so. Um, and so this rock has is typified by very high magnesium oxide content. So this is in weight percent, 38% uh, magnesium and relatively low aluminium and calcium. Um, so what we do is we subject then that composition to heating in a what's known as an aerodynamic laser levitation furnace. And this is housed at the Institut de Physique du Bleu de and it enables heating up to 1900 Celsius, um, which is what we did in order to be able to melt entirely uh, the sample. And so I'll just show a quick video of that, how that looks now, and I can describe uh, the experimental setup. 
So here's our small furnace. Um, what we see is now a video, video of the ball floating in midair, being suspended by a gas stream, and at the same time being heated such that we achieve these temperatures of 1900 degrees measured by pyrometry. Um, and then finally, we can quench it after it's been sitting there for 30 seconds, simply by turning off the power to the laser. And the quenching serves to preserve the high temperature state of the liquid uh, in a glassy form, as you can see here. So that, that glass is uh, representative of what we think the uh, thermodynamics and chemistry of the liquid was at high temperature. And in this process, we vary the gas mixture that is flowing around this miniature, miniature Earth uh, by changing the hydrogen to carbon dioxide ratio of the input gas. Um, and so by doing so, we can achieve uh, oxygen fugacities relative to this iron vistite buffer uh, between 1.5 log units below and five log units above. Um, and so this enables us then to create um, silicate magma oceans with different Fe3 plus to two plus ratios, um, thereby providing us with some sort of calibration. And so the step, the next step is to determine then the iron three plus to two plus ratio in these glasses um, and we can do that after we've recovered the glass by a technique known as Xanes, so X-ray absorption near edge structure. Um, and this was performed at uh, the INK edge. So the idea is that we uh, bombard the sample with X-rays of a particular energy such that they can excite electronic transitions within the ion atoms. And the absorption of those X-rays is subtly dependent on the oxidation state of iron simply because there are, is a slightly different electronic configuration and thereby a different probability for different electronic transitions to occur. Um, and this is shown uh, graphically here on, uh, in this plot on the left, in which we can see that the uh, centroid energy shifts uh, to higher energies as we go from reduced conditions at the bottom to oxidized conditions at the top. And so this um, the shift in the centroid peak energy is quantifiable um, to a very good precision uh, through the fitting of Gaussian uh, and Lorentzian peaks to the, to the centroid and to the edge step here. Um, and uh, this then gives us an empirical calibration for the ion 3 plus to 2 plus ratio in, in the glass. So the other feature that you'll see is that the edge position also shifts from low energy at the bottom to uh, rather higher energies at the top. And so we can use both of these features in tandem to quantify the ion three plus to two plus ratios in our experimental glasses. Um, and so this is just technical parameters that we used on the beam line to uh, analyze the glasses. We also, we also verified that the glasses were indeed homogeneous, uh, homogeneous glasses. Um, and so, of course, we need a, uh, an independent calibration for this technique because it is uh, relative um, and empirical, um, not an absolute technique. And so to do that, we measured the ion 3 plus 2 plus ratios in some standard glasses uh, by a different technique, which is known as Mesbauer spectroscopy, um, and used that set of different type of glasses as a calibration series for our pyridotite glasses. And what we observe here in green uh, is the pyridotite glasses, which fall upon the same trend as that defined by these uh, standard glasses, which are of mid-ocean rich basalt composition. So that's the most common um, basalt on earth. Um, and so this, this lends credence to the idea that the calibration for basaltic glasses is also applicable uh, to the glasses of rather different composition that we have uh, synthesized in the lab um, uh, as shown earlier of the, of the pyridotite glass. Um, and so with this, with this technique, we can achieve up to sort of 1.5% uh, relative on the iron three plus to total iron ratio in the glasses, which is sufficient of sufficient accuracy and precision to, um, to be able to uh, quantify oxygen fugacity as a function of Fe3 plus two plus ratio. So that's the experimental part, uh, which I'll come back to in a couple of slides, um, but now I would like to sort of make the jump between the experiments and the oxidation state of the earth. And so in order to apply the calibration for a pyridotite in its liquid state, we should uh, be aware or should be able to quantify the iron three plus two plus ratios in pyridotites in earth's mantle today. 
And so this is kind of the target value that we want to obtain in our experiments. And so we can have a handle on the iron three plus two plus ratio in earth mantle today by looking at uh, the individual redox ratios in the minerals that constitute pyritite of a picture of which is shown on the left here. So it's mainly olivine and orthopyroxene, but it has minor clinopyroxene and also spinel. And so we're able to measure, uh, well, this was measured in the 1990s by Dante Canil and Hugh O'Neill, and they determined iron three plus to total iron ratios in different minerals. And knowing their iron contents, we're able to perform a mass balance calculation, which uh, was um, synthesized um, iron three plus to two plus ratios of a global array of uh, pyridotites, including orogenic, continental, and cratonic. Um, so different pyridotites observed in different uh, locations around the world. And what these data show were essentially that the iron three plus two plus ratio in pyridotites is correlated with the amount of MGO or anti-correlated with the amount of MGO in the, in the whole rock. Um, and so this comes as no surprise because um, the pyridotites that have higher MGO are those that have experienced more partial melting, i.e. there has been more basalt extracted from the pyridotite. And this means that you uh, actually enrich the amount of olivine that is left in the mantle. And because olivine has the lowest iron three plus content of all the minerals, the corresponding bulk rock also has low iron three plus contents. And so what we need to do is to find the uh, primitive mantle value. So this is the composition of the mantle uh, that we think existed prior to uh, having any of the continental crust or oceanic crust extracted on Earth. And so this uh, is determined by independent means uh, and is thought to be around 37% MGO. And so using this rather you know, sort of broad correlation, we're able to define uh, an iron three plus to total iron ratio that we think is representative of the entire mantle prior to its differentiation into a uh, mantle, a depleted mantle and the crust. And so this turns out to be this magic figure, 3.7% iron three plus. So here are the results from the experimental work. And what we observe is that the, uh, the logarithm of the iron three plus to two plus ratio in the glasses is positively correlated with the um, oxygen fugacity at which the glass or the melt was equilibrated with the gas. And this, the slope of this correlation is 0.25, which you will recognize also appears here as the stoichiometric coefficient for oxygen in reaction. And so what this means is that where this, this reaction is ideal in prototype liquids, it follows the ideal stoichiometry. Um, and we use this calibration curve then to, to read off if we know the iron three plus to two plus ratio uh, of our pyridotites, we can then use this curve to tell us what the oxygen fugacity was at the surface of the magma ocean on the early earth. And so what this value is, is um, half a log unit above the iron of the stack buffer, which may not mean much to you, um, but um, it'll become important in, in later slides. So at the moment, what we can say uh, is that this oxygen fugacity fixes the CO2 to CO and H2O to H2 ratios in our atmosphere if we know the temperature. However, if we want to solve for the atmosphere's composition uh, in its entirety, then we need also need other constraints. So firstly, we have our oxygen fugacity constraint given by the iron three plus two plus ratio. But in an HCNO atmosphere, we need also the H on C ratio, so the molar, uh, molar ratio of H to, uh, to carbon, and the molar ratio of hydrogen to nitrogen. Um, and so this is done by firstly uh, computing the bulk silicate earth abundances, which we can have, which we have a good estimate for. And secondly, how these, uh, how the masses of these elements are distributed between the atmosphere and the pyridotite liquid. And so to do this, we need to understand the solubility laws for the, these different elements in pyridotite uh, magma. Unfortunately, experimental constraints for this are also rather sparse. And so we have to make do with um, calibrations based on basaltic rocks, similar to that which we initially had for iron. And so these are just the these are just the dissolution models. So we think water initially dissolves as uh, OH minus. 
carb uh, carbon dioxide dissolves as CO3 two minus and um, nitrogen dissolves as molecular nitrogen. Um, and so the, the, the equilibrium constants of these reactions have been calibrated by various authors uh, over, over, the, over the years. And what they show is that solubility of water is about 100 times greater than that of carbon dioxide. And so we're only considering carbon dioxide and water here because we're at relatively oxidizing conditions as constrained by our um, peridotite Fe3 plus 2 plus ratios. And so this, this plot on the left illustrates that for the same fugacity of, um, of water, you can see that water is present in the melt, uh, on, which is on the y-axis, at significantly higher concentrations than is CO2. So in order to reach, for example, the same concentration in the melt uh, that you achieve for water at one, uh, one bar, so you get 400 ppm at FH2O equals one, you need uh, an FCO2 of about uh, 100, uh, about 1,000. So you get, yeah, it's about a factor of 100 or to 1,000 more soluble. So this is the mass balance equation that indicates uh, then we can, based on the solubility data, calculate how much uh, pressure is, is released to the atmosphere and how much is dissolved in the melt. So the X relates to the mole fraction dissolved, the P relates to the partial pressure in the atmosphere. Um, and so using this equation, we calculate that about 99% of the water and about 35% of the CO2 is dissolved in the magma ocean, whereas nitrogen is essentially entirely in the atmosphere. And so this is what we obtain uh, at high temperatures. And so this is the speciation of uh, an atmosphere degassed in equilibrium with the magma ocean starting at this 1900 degrees Celsius um, temperature. And so what you can see is that it's actually mainly CO and CO2 uh, in the atmosphere, whereas uh, for water we, or for hydrogen, we see that it's a mixture of, of hyd molecular hydrogen and water. Um, and uh, at high temperatures, this, this speciation is rather constant, doesn't change too much, uh, and even below the crystallization temperature of peridotite, it's not expected to, to differ. However, if we let this uh, atmosphere cool, uh, in a closed system, which is again an approximation, then we obtain uh, the saturation of graphite at about 1000 Kelvin, um, and that, that um, gets rid of most of the reduced species such as CO and H2. Uh, and then at a lower temperature still, we have the condensation of water into the oceans. And what we're left with is an atmosphere which is contained, which is comprised of largely CO2 and nitrogen in very similar proportions uh, to what we observe uh, on Venus today, which is shown on the right. Um, and so on this basis, we see that probably Earth's atmosphere would have ended up something of having something like 70 bars of CO2 and two bars of nitrogen with this CO2 to N2 ratio of about 35, which is, as you may recall, rather similar to the CO2 to N2 ratio that we observed on uh, Venus, that we observe on Venus today, which is about 40. So on this basis, we would expect actually that the composition of the terrestrial atmosphere actually resembled that of Venus uh, initially. Some of you may be asking what about if when you crystallize the magma ocean some of the water may actually dissolve upon crystallization um, and we have thought about that and that is uh, shown here. So this is the effect of the uh, hydrogen to carbon ratio on the composition of an atmosphere at 2173 Kelvin. So this is the, the composition of the atmosphere that we calculate based on um, the solubility laws as I said, mainly CO and CO2 with minor H2 and H2O. And if you degas 100% uh, of the water that we think is in the earth um, during the crystallization, for example, then you end up with a, a rather H2 to H2O rich atmosphere. So this, this line and these numbers represent the percentage of water that degasses, uh, that can degas from the, from the melt. Then if you take the same composition that we calculated at 2173, and cooled it down uh, to 300 Kelvin, you, you can see the sort of the various stability fields of the different atmospheres. Um, so these lines here indicate the uh, hydrogen to carbon ratios of the bulk silicate earth, meaning that you can't exceed that, that ratio because that's all of the hydrogen that you have in the earth. Um, and so what this shows is essentially that as long as you don't degas more than about 75 to 80% of the water, 
the atmosphere will always be in this CO2 to N2 rich uh, regime. So this, these contours indicate the CO2 to N2 ratio up to here, and then they indicate the CH4 to N2 ratio above the purple line. Um, and so this conclusion that the Earth's atmosphere uh, was rather like that of Venus is rather robust, considering that we don't expect uh, all of the water to degas because it, is, it has some finite solubility in mantle minerals and uh, as well we may expect some melt to be trapped in the magma ocean depending on the style of crystallization. Okay so then the question then becomes if the earth did indeed have such a CO2 to N2 rich uh, CO2 to N2 uh, ratio of 97 to 3 um, then why has it evolved so differently from its planetary neighbors? So here we can appeal to some physical controls, considering that the chemistry was likely similar. Firstly, the Earth receives about half as much solar irradiance as Venus, uh, meaning it, it should be much cooler as, in terms of its equilibrium temperature, uh, but twice as much as Mars. And uh, moreover, the Earth is similar to Venus, so it's, so it's uh, about as effective as retaining its atmosphere in that regard, but it's much larger than Mars, meaning again, Mars is more likely to have lost its atmosphere. Uh, just based on the size. Um, we can actually put more quantitative constraints on this by considering um, the escape parameter lambda esc, which essentially plots the ratio of the um, escape velocity needed to accelerate a particle from the surface of a planet to infinity and relative to the mean thermal velocity of the gas, which is given by uh, square root 2 kV on T. Um, and so this, um, this, this dimension, this number, allows us to compute the facility with which an atmosphere may be lost on planetary bodies. Um, and so what this shows is that the higher the number, the harder it is for an atmosphere to escape, because the escape velocity is very high. And so then loss is most efficient for uh, lighter mass atmospheres that is composed of hydrogen and helium, so that if we consider the atmospheres on the three terrestrial planets were somewhat similar. This, this factor cancels out. And then we have uh, losses most easy, is, is, is most, uh, uh, most uh, readily achieved for smaller bodies, uh, i.e. low escape velocity and for hotter atmospheres, i.e. Uh, high temperatures um, here in the exabase I've, I've uh, listed. So this kind of hierarchy can actually be sort of um, verified by the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. Because you can, as, you sh as, as I show in the equation above, the, the degree of atmospheric escape is, um, is proportional, um, is inversely proportional to the mass of the element or the isotope being lost. And so if we consider the deuterium to hydrogen ratio, the higher the ratio, the more uh, of the atmosphere or at least of hydrogen should have been lost from the, from the atmosphere. And looking at this ratio, we see that normalized to that of the earth, uh, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of Mars is about six times higher and that of Venus about 150 times higher, which means that atmospheric escape was um, uh, increased in the order Earth, then to Mars, and then to Venus experiencing the most atmospheric escape. The consequence of this is that, at least relative to Venus and Mars, Earth can retain liquid water on its surface over geological timescales. Now this is important because um, it is needed to solubilize uh, CO2 such that it may participate in the urea reaction, uh, which is shown above here, for example, with calcium silicate plus CO2 equals calcium carbonate, i.e. Uh, limestone plus uh, quartz. Um, and so this is not a new idea as, as implied by the name, Harold Urey also makes an appearance here. Um, and it was quantified nicely by Norm Sleep in the early 2000s and this is a figure from his paper, which shows the equilibrium constants uh, for these type of reactions. So these, these different numbers correspond to the reactions, but substituting for calcium are different elements such as magnesium or iron, et cetera. And so what these reactions indicate is that as long as you can dissolve CO2 into water, then you are going to buffer the CO2 pressure in the atmosphere to, depending if it's 100 degrees, we buffer the CO2 pressure to about um, one bar uh, according to reaction five or, um, sorry, um, 
10 to the minus three bars if we consider reaction one. So approximately in that range, this reaction serves to temper the um, CO2 levels that we observe in the atmosphere. And according to the, their modeling, this may occur over about 100 million years or so. So what, where does this leave us for the development of life? Um, as I mentioned earlier, these CH4 to uh, the CH4 NH3 atmospheres envisaged by Miller and Urey um, were thought to be the, the, the most efficient way of, uh, of developing prebiotic chemistry in a way such that it could lead to development of life. And indeed, uh, experiments, similar experiments performed in CO2 to N2 atmospheres were shown to be rather inefficient in synthesizing the amino acids. So they, they found glycine only. However, more recent experiments uh, performed by Cleves and others um, in which they looked at the amount of amino acids produced in the presence of water, but now buffered uh, with calcium carbonate as, uh, as suggested by the Uri reaction, showed that actually you can get a significant yields of many more amino acids uh, in such a scenario. However, uh, it should be noted that these yields are still about half of that um, observed in the original Miller-Urey experiment. So although it's not, uh, it's not um, as productive, it shows that it's not impossible to uh, synthesize such acids in, in these environments. So this idea of warm little ponds may still, may still apply. Okay, so that, that is the end of the talk. Um, just to finish up with some conclusions, um, we calibrated the dependence of iron 3 plus to 2 plus on oxygen fugacity in prototype liquids that is relevant to uh, magma ocean on planets and particularly on Earth. On this basis, we, we, we uh, conclude that the Earth had a neutral Venus-like atmosphere composed of CO2 and N2 in 97 to 3 proportions, um, and that the the large mass and distance from the sun for the Earth minimized uh, hydrogen loss uh, as compared to Venus and Mars. And this allowed uh, the drawdown of a CO2 uh, atmosphere thereafter uh, on the Earth, but not on Mars and Venus. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much, Paolo. Uh, so does it, if anyone has any uh, questions, feel free to raise your hand or uh, post them in chat. It looks like we have one. Uh, Vlad, you can go ahead. Um, yes, um, hello. Um, uh, thanks for a nice talk. And uh, uh, those experiments are really very important in understanding that uh, the factors controlling uh, iron uh, 3 plus to iron 2 plus. And um, so the one question that I have, you mentioned um, uh, that how um, the uh, evolutionary history is, uh, uh, you know, can uh, change on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Venus versus Earth versus Mars. And given that the Martian mass is 10 times uh, less than the Earth, so the uh, probably the iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus also depends on pressure, right? So did you have you done those experiments for the pressures basically changing from, you know, like one bar to few hundreds bars to like uh, 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 for, for kilobars? Um, to, to, to gigapark pa uh, pascals, let's say. And, uh, and so I, I would imagine the temperature would be probably an um, important factor. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, this is an interesting question, which has also been uh, hotly debated in the community, I would say, over the, over the recent, uh, recent past. And so the effective pressure is sort of... Um, uh, interesting because it first, if you go, it, it, you require you know a few GPA, a few gigapascals to uh, modify the iron three plus two plus ratio just by pressure at a constant oxygen fugacity, and it firstly you stabilize iron two plus up to about ten GPA, and then you start stabilizing iron three plus again, uh, and so this indeed suggests that there could be an influence on the iron three plus two plus ratio as a factor of planetary size. Interestingly, the um, the uh, pressure at which the core formation on Mars was thought to have occurred is about 10 GPA, which is actually at this iron 3 plus 2 plus minimum. So we may expect that Mars may have been more reduced simply because of that. And so it, it may not have, a, have evolved to a CO2 to N2 atmosphere, um, but we haven't done all of the experiments to, to figure that out yet. Um, but yes, uh, uh, what I what I would also what I would also point to is that this um, CO two to N two field is re relatively large um, for realistic 
H on C ratios. So if you, even if you're at more reducing conditions, so I understand minus two, you would still have a relatively large stability field of CO2 to N2 rich atmospheres. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so my second question would be, uh, um, is the, um, you know, about the solubility of, you said that nitrogen, molecular nitrogen is not soluble, that's, that's known, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, we're doing the theoretical models of studying how the active young sun affected, you know, through the ionizing radiation affected the dissociation of molecular nitrogen into, uh, you know, atomic nitrogen forming NOxs. So, but NO uh, uh, actually in turn is very soluble, right? So, and uh, and can, uh, can can so the nitrogen uh, can basically get uh, into the magma ocean through through NO rather than N2. So that it's in the younger, you know, early phases in the first, uh, in the first, um, you know, a few hundred uh, million years after the formation of our sun, when the sun was particularly uh, uh, um, um, uh, active. And mm -hmm. the second effect of that sun will be that the atmospheric escape that you mentioned, uh, you just talked about the, the thermal escape. The lambda escape, you know, describes only thermal escape. However, we know that even today, at the current Earth, every time we have a big flare, we have non-thermal escape with the predominant escape of a plus, a plus. So the oxygen escapes. So you basically, you know, you can dissociate water and you create OHs, and then you uh, ionize oxygen. You and O plus escapes better than OH. Actually, mm -hmm. from that point of view, you know, might be given that. Uh, uh, on Venus, the, the the amount of ionizing radiation was by a factor of two greater, not just um, the, the total amount, right? Um, then we can escape, uh, expect that the uh, the, the, the non-thermal escape O plus was also was much, much more efficient, uh, probably you know providing conditions for the escaping of water from the planet. Mm -hmm. planet. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, we did not uh, treat the non-thermal escape simply because I think the physics is a li little bit more complicated, but it's still possible to do. Uh, of course, um, but as you said, I think the the tendency would be in the same in the same direction. I.e., the hierarchy of element of uh, atmospheric loss would, would decrease in the order, sort of Venus, uh, then Earth in this case, and then Mars. But yeah, so I think you know in all in in that situation as well, you would expect that Venus would have lost more of its water than at least the Earth has. Um, and I guess the other point with the nitrogen. I would say that that could occur in more of the upper atmosphere, uh, but I think for the equilibrium, it may be important that that NO is able to reach the magma ocean surface, which is a lot denser. So I'm not sure if the photoionizing radiation is sufficient to access and modify the chemistry right at the interface where you would expect the equilibrium between the magma and the atmosphere. But uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, photo is not important, but the, the particle is because the particles penetrate through the atmosphere and uh, to the lower, uh, you know, uh, ranges and they can create a lot of NO. So that's the one of the uh, results of our model. By the way, so we have the model for the, uh, you know, non-thermal escape. So we can maybe talk about that. Sure. You know. yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, and uh, there was a question in chat for you. Um, I think it was in uh, relation to the uh, um, your slide talking about uh, the outgassing for the early uh, early atmosphere, the cooling of the early atmosphere. Um, does that mean that we shouldn't expect an initial steam atmosphere after an impact induced magma ocean, or does that maybe change at even higher temperatures? So, is is it referring to this figure? I guess. Um, uh, I think but so, uh, Pro probably, are you still on? Yeah, sorry, yeah, yes, uh -huh. it's, uh, that uh, particular figure. Okay, so I th so the only way I think that we can get a lot of water to outgas is to um, uh, have, a re have a more reduced um, planet uh, because hydrogen is a lot less soluble than water is. So if we're able to um, have it such that it's hydrogen that's stable rather than water, then most of that hydrogen should be in the atmosphere. Um, and so that, that's probably uh, a mechanism to get, the, to get the hydrogen out of the magma ocean. Because in this situation, even though there's more water in the, in the bulk earth, 99% of it is dissolved uh, in these, under, these under these more oxidizing conditions. And that's why the hydrogen species are lower in their partial pressures or their fugacities than the carbon species. But yeah, this is only at a, this is only at this particular FO2. 
So if, you, if this was calculation was done at lower oxygen fugacity, then these species should be higher. And in particular, H2 should be higher. Um, yeah, that's, that's super point. interesting. I mean, like being able to figure out what that limit on the fugacity is at which you start to see steam atmospheres dominate, it would be interesting for not only the early Earth post moon impact, but you know, just looking at exoplanets that might be hit by impacts that might have steam atmospheres. Absolutely, I, I completely agree. Um, as I think if you can measure also in the exoplanets, I think if you can measure the H2 to H2O ratio in the atmosphere, that should tell you something about, and, and the temperature, that should tell you something about the oxidation state of the interior. Thanks, no, awesome. Yeah, really cool things to future work, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> thanks. I kind of had a uh, maybe a little bit of a similar question. I'm just not too familiar with this this area of research. On that previous slide again, um, can you talk a little bit more about what's what's uh, leading to that dip in water there at uh, like yeah. a, a, a thousand Kelvin or so? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that middle one there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the saturation of graphite. So um, if we cool it enough, then graphite starts to precipitate out of the atmosphere. Um, and the reaction is such that you, because you're taking carbon out, you're enriching oxygen in the atmosphere, relatively speaking. So you, there's now the, the oxygen to carbon ratio is higher or the oxygen to water ratio, or oxygen to hydrogen ratio is higher. And therefore you destabilize these reduced species. So H2 and CO in preference of the uh, oxidized species so CO2 and H2O. And that's caused by this graphite precipitation reaction. Gotcha, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, my last question, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, it's kind of just, I just wanted to to, to totally speculate. And uh, like one of the big uh, things in exoplanet research is the discovery of super Earths, you know, that are not Neptunes, but that are not really Earths <laughs> either. Um, so these much more massive planets that you know, maybe their upper mantle is kind of similar to the Earth, but their deep mantle is definitely going to be different. Um, yep. And their escapes are going to be really different because of the gravity. So I was just curious, uh, you know, what things can you kind of speculate on are going to change as you move to this higher mass regime? Yep, that's a really good question. I was actually just talking about this with a colleague today. Um, oh, nice. Um, <laughs> and um, I think so the difference with the sub-Neptunes is that this is the atmosphere volumetrically and in terms of mass, a much more significant part of the entire planetary assembly. And so you, in this situation, it's in this situation, we're assuming that the interior effectively exerts the predominant control on the atmosphere, whereas for the sub-Neptunes, the two may play sort of sub-equal roles. And we think that these sub-Neptunes have a lot of hydrogen in them. And so we would be pushed over to the sort of uh, this side of the diagram. So this area here of this sort of diagram. So the more hydrogen you have, probably the lower the oxygen fugacity, and the more likely you are to, when you cool down, have species like methane and ammonia, also because of the high pressures. This is, methane is particularly stabilized by high, higher total pressures. And so I think that would be really interesting to look at how much, how much hydrogen you can dissolve, uh, how much hydrogen remains in the atmosphere. But I think it's clear that we're going to go from more of a CO2 to N2 atmosphere that we would expect for terrestrial bodies to a more uh, hydrogen, methane, ammonia type atmosphere for the sub Neptunes. That would be my guess. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions for Dr. Sosi? All right. Well, if not, thank you again so much. This is really cool work, really interesting stuff. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, hope you have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right. Well, happy be, if you want to email me about anything and uh, happy to answer and uh, discuss. Great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Well, uh, for everyone else, uh, the next Exoplan seminar is going to be on September 30th. And I hope everyone has a great week. Take care. Thanks again, Paulo. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.